Um, welcome everyone. I'm gonna go to share my screen now. Um, I will have a presentation at first and um, there's some questions I put in there. So if you wanna have something to write down some different ideas as we're going through the slides, that will be fine. Um, and then we'll do um, questions and answers at, at the end. So that way it makes a nice flow. Um, also, some of the material could be sensitive or bring up different things since I may talk about um, aspects related to fertility, infertility, and I really appreciate no matter where you are on the journey of that. So I want you to know this is a safe space. Um, if you need to leave, that's fine. You can also reach back later if you have questions or want anything answered personally as well. So thank you. And with that, I'll give you my screen. Okay, so um, we'll you can still see my thumbnail as well. So I just want to start with acknowledging and giving thanks for the lands that were on here in Hawaii. That's the illegally occupied nation of Hawaii. And um, soon we'll have Vaughn Mahalona come on. She, so when she comes on, Rhonda will unmute her. Um, and she is a Kanaka Maoli birth worker. So everyone where you are, thank you for spending the time with us today and um, learning some information. You can always put the questions into the chat box as well. Give a second to see if we have Vaughn on. And while we're waiting for her, I can give a little introduction about myself as well. So um, I am a midwife and also IBCLC um, currently in Hawaii. And um, I've had kind of an interesting experience of working um, in a variety of settings. So birth center, community birth, um, in people's homes, as well as doing disaster relief and um, emergency settings. And my project I've been working on this year now is building a mobile clinic to really meet people where they're at and help break down the barriers towards um, people getting respective care. Okay, we've got Vaughn Mahalona on now and she's going to um, welcome Vaughn. She's going to be giving us um, some pule and um, talk a little bit about our land here. Aloha, aloha mai kako, o wau o Ivan Mahelona kuui noa, noho, uh, no nana kuli mai au, noho au ma komo ili ili, um, o mauna kia kuu kiko, o ana o iro kuu kai, o kaya ulu kuu makani, um, aloha mai kako, I'm Ivan Mahelona. Um, I'm from Nanakuli, which is on the west side of Oahu, um, in the illegally occupied nation of Hawaii. Um, I'm currently living in Honolulu, otherwise known as Komo Ili Ili. Um, or if you visit here, it's Makali right out of Waikiki, right outside of Waikiki. Um, Mauna Kea is my pico. Um, the oceans of Ano Oio are my oceans. Um, the Kaya'ulu wind is my winds. Um, uh, one of the pule that I'm going to do um, is calling in all of our collective ancestors. Um, and so like when we introduce ourselves, we introduce our mountains as our ancestor, our waters as our ancestors, all of our elements as our, our kupuna um, who, uh, yeah, who give us like, um, so the pool I'm going to do is just calling on all of our kupuna to give us the wisdom, knowledge, the understanding, the strength um, to be in this space. Um, mahalo Jacqueline for um, honoring the lands that we are on. Again, the illegally occupied nation of Hawaii. Um, yeah. <coughs> Na aumakua mai kalahiki Mai ka hooku ia ka halawai. Na au mākua ia ka hina ākua ia ka hina ālo. Ia ka akau i kalani. O kihai kalani. O we kalani. Nunulu i kalani. Kaholo i kalani. E ia nā kula kula a o ko o mauna a wākea. E malama o ko ia mako. E ulu i kalani. E ulu i ka honua. E ulu i ka pai aina o Hawaii. E ho mai ka ike. E ho mai kai kaika, e ho mai ki akamai, e ho mai ka mau popopono, e ho mai ka ike papa lua, e ho mai ka mana. Na au mākua mai ka lahi ki akalākau, mai ka hoku i akahalawai. Na au mākua ya ka hina ākua, ya ka hina alo, ya ka akau i kalani, 
o ki hai kalani, o we kalani, nunu lui kalani, kaho lui kalani. E ya na pula pula o ko ka ohana o Center for Indigenous Midwifery. E ma lama o ko ya mako, e ului kalani, e ului ka honua, e ului ka pai aina o Hawaii, e ho mai ka ike, e ho mai ka ikaika, e ho mai ki akamai, E ho mai ka maopopopono, e ho mai ka ike papa lua, e ho mai ka mana. A mama ueno. Mahalo. Mahalo, Vaughn. Okay, so now I will also talk about um, a quick disclaimer here that's not intended to emplace um, medical advice while we're discuss different topics and I have no conflicts or sponsors. Um, so why fertility? I was um, glad that this topic had came up. Rhonda said she gets a lot of questions about this um, with Center from Digis Midwifery with people wanting to find different information. And so again, I'll present like an overview today, um, but this is something I'm very passionate about. And it really, I didn't know that it would really become my passion um, until I had my children and struggled with the first ones. So as I mentioned, um, I work in birth and have been doing it, you know, it was like a doula before, maybe there was that term um, in the early 2000s, chose to go to midwifery school in about 11 years ago. Um, and then, you know, just worked in a variety of different settings. So as I was finishing up school, it was like time to start getting ready to have kids or that seemed like the next progression there. Um, and I had, a, I had an early inkling that, okay, this might be a challenge. And I don't even know why at first, but I was away from um, where I'd grown up and from rural Alaska. And there's, we, you know, it was not like a fertility issue in the family or something like this, but I was older to start out with. I think, um, actually no, when I started maybe more like 30. So um, not over the hill as we start to say like 35 or something. Um, and yeah, so then just as I started to work more, you know, it starts off being fun or, you know, we're gonna casually try and have a child or something. And then that months turned into years and trying to like keep adding on different things to try. And I had so many aversions about, um, you know, wanting to seek help or feeling like a failure. And honestly, that became really the worst low part of my life. And um, in researching this, I've done another keynote before about um, reproductive technology specifically. Um, people often say that with having infertility, whether it's a diagnosis or just the unexplained and maybe you haven't gotten help at um, figuring out why you can't have kids, it's as low as getting a death sentence for like um, cancer or a disease that has no cure because you really feel like your body starts to fail you. And then trying to find the connection of who you can reach out to and feeling this shame when it doesn't have to be that way. If there was a problem, like a broken leg, you would go and get it set or, um, you know, an access to food. You try and find a place to go and get that resource so that you could be full. But with, with family building, it becomes more complicated. Um, many of the services become cost prohibitive for people or there's not specialists around for you know a large geographic area. So it's um, emotional, exhaustive, expensive, and really all consuming um, once you get into that. So, you know, I really like to try and see how we can weave in what are more um, natural ways to help prepare the body for success at any different age um, or you know, history. We all have different histories that um, bring us together. And then like when to seek in to reach other people. So that is a little bit about my story. Um, I have, here's my family here. So um, this first picture on the left is my twins. I have twins, they were born at home. You can see that I think that, that was the, gonna be the end of my um, family building and the content, nice afterbirth glow there, 44 hour labor, um, full-term twins, 40 plus one. So I was really excited that even with some interventions that came into their birth, um, I was able to have this, you know, experience still be miraculous and, um, you know, natural at home as could be. Um, 
And then unexpectedly, after I was done breastfeeding, I got pregnant again. And that was the first time I've ever had a spontaneous pregnancy, um, which ended in a miscarriage. And that's the photo there that I was able to find. Um, and that was, you know, I was really thankful for that. I'm very grateful for that experience, actually, because I never thought that that would be possible. So I really saw that as a positive sign about um, conception coming back and getting to, you know, know what it would feel like to be in my um, cycle. And then immediately after um, got pregnant again at 40. And as you can see there, that is my family now. And I do feel like my family is complete. So whether family building um, ends with a child or not, I will always consider myself a survivor. So here's some different factors that when I start to think negatively, what affected my fertility um, when I was trying to conceive and that in those first years like that? Well, first of all, like the stress. And I do think, you know, these are some of the things that we could control versus medical history. So with stress, just obviously finishing midwifery school, it's a very stressful time, staying up late or, um, or, or all night or multiple days, right, as we do, and then catching sleep where we can, um, it really throws off that natural rhythm. Crossing time zones, um, as I mentioned, when I first had got my uh, California license, I started doing a lot of international work. And so, you know, I'd leave to go to Haiti. I came back. I went to Philippines a few times, came back. And so you're always trying to reset your body into um, what your home time zone is. Um, and then worry and anxiety, just yes, because this isn't happening. Am I normal? And, and all the kind of the fears that go with it, societal pressure as well. Um, that wasn't helpful. Poor eating habits could run, you know, some days you're just eating a protein bar when it's like in the middle of the night snacks, or am I having enough water to drink? Am I really like giving my body that good nourishment that it needs to not only fill myself, but be an open um, vessel for a child? I put excessive caffeine. I don't know if I always have, but um, I definitely love my uh, espresso. And then you start to think in, well, do I drink more caffeine? Do I take in some? But it could be in chocolate. It could be in tea, things like that. Um, and is that encouraging? There's different trains of thoughts about caffeine. But anyway, another thing to put in there, occasional alcohol is another one. And um, again, for people, they may have different um, amounts that they take that would be considered okay or none. Um, but I definitely just, yeah, drink some wine during that period. And again, it'd be like, well, okay, you didn't get pregnant. So, you know, Okay, try again this month or let's do something, celebrate, change your mindset. Inconsistent activity, I think as well. Um, so, you know, I love to dance. Was I always doing that or being outside or finding something that regrounds you, resets you like that too. And all that's getting back to this like ground level of optimum health. So um, throughout my presentation, as I mentioned, I'll have some questions on there and you can start to think like, what would be negatively affecting that? And I will say too, at the time I was living in Los Angeles, which um, it was busy and, you know, just as soon as you walk out the door, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, we had everything from illegal activity up front, just people, is the air different? I don't know. And then some positive things. What was really different once I was um, pregnant with my, and again, these are, I, I kind of geared towards me, but you can see how they'd affect towards anybody. Um, what positively made it more receptive to have a child, welcome a child in. And then I went from living in this large, busy city to being in the island of Hawaii and this farm where there was no Wi-Fi. You know, we, we ate a lot of local food. Um, once it was dark, you go to sleep. And um, the, my older two were then in preschool. So then they're on this routine like that. There was no going, going and worrying about the different things. Um, mostly staying really local. We didn't leave the island and stuff like that. Eating the whole foods, drinking plenty of water. We had really good um, stream water that then was um, oxygenated. Um, I just drank tea at this time too. I think, you know, like breastfeeding, you get so dehydrated. So just, I was being very aware of like um, staying hydrated and also with the twins. Um, and yeah, I think just like having a different um, living situation didn't even make me, you know, we, there was no place, we're not going out. And so maybe a cup of wine in a whole year, right? And then just um, active things were, you know, being on the farm, that you have to machete down a trail to get to the house where we're going to stay. And then does it need a new roof? Um, 
bringing furniture and all these things versus thinking of like a set time to just have exercise. What could be enjoyable activities? When I take the kids to preschool, I go for a long outdoor walk. So things like that to positively contribute. So some basic ways to prepare for success. And again, I think this could happen in any lifespan is to think of your overall health first um, for people. And you could, this will be helpful if you're a student or um, for practitioners here to um, work with, think with your clients. If you have somebody coming in with you young and wants to know about their fertility and their cycle, you know, ask, do they have regular periods? Um, if, if they want to get into more active lifestyle, um, some people are overweight, some people might be underweight. So finding like what that optimal level is for them and how can they get there with having a balanced diet, but with foods that are local and important to you, um, ancestral foods. I know for me, even though I'm far from my family right now, I'll feel the best if I um, have salmon and moose and, and even right now I've got bear in my freezer. So I'm always mixing um, those with what I can get here to really, you know, also give my kids that good strong start to the to their lives. And so they grow up knowing the taste that um, is important. And then, yeah, I think finding the activities that you enjoy. So this doesn't have to necessarily be exercise, but if you like to draw, are you finding ways to add that into your life? So it's not just an assignment for school or, you know, something for work or getting too busy that you're not able to like bring these into daily life. And um, this is an interesting time with this as well with COVID, right? We've all had precautions around the world um, that make it or that can make it really hard to find that time for yourself. Um, and just, you know, when you're taking them out of every schedule, we're all stuck together in a tight place, but just, you know, remember why we love each other and um, to treat yourself first. At the same time, trying to get fresh air daily. And also that will depend where you are, but just regrounding, take your shoes off. If it's cold, feel the snow. If it's um, here in Hawaii, feel the water on your feet breathe in the wind um, and just get that grounding. We can get really far away from it being in a city or getting caught up in lives being busy or just on Zoom all the time. I know I definitely get over Zoom at some point um, at the end of last year, especially. So supplementing, I just mentioned here for a second. Um, I don't know if the thumb, the thumb views are blocking it, but anyway, um, specific needs can vary. So aid quality is one thing that you can boost yourself. Um, and generally as midwives, that'll be the people that we're seeing are the, um, the birthing parent, as opposed to, um, dealing with sperm, although that can come in to be some of the things that we look at as well. And often with foods that will help with fertility could be useful for, um, men and women looking at egg health and sperm health. So a good quality prenatal vitamin. Um, I like ones that are whole foods based. So that it will give you folate versus folic acid. They're not gonna hurt your stomach. You could have on an empty stomach as well. Um, and maybe one that you might take throughout the day. But if you're eating a good balanced diet, that could be like your insurance policy. Um, so if you had a day that you had to just eat what you needed, comfort food, maybe you're missing some of the minerals, nutrients that you can have that. Um, CoQ10, I really have seen some good um, things with this for, towards fertility. And the therapeutic dose again will vary with what your provider will say, but that can help really boost um, the mitochondria. So like the powerhouse for your eggs, um, just to make them, you know, as juicy as you can. And the DHA would be for um, brain support there too. About abdominal massage, um, I feel like this is a useful thing and there's definitely classes and certifications that you could do from this, but I also see it as being instinctual, just touching our body, getting used to like, where is the blood flowing? What is bringing heat and energy and movement to the area that we need our womb to cultivate, um, you know, a nice pillow place for our um, life to want to implant and start and grow. And then just writing about this experience too. And I wish I would have done this more um, because you know, over time we change our perception of what we think about things, right? So um, I, I don't have writings from when I was in that deep despair moments and like feeling there's nowhere to turn to. And I think that'd be really interesting to see later and to see how did you come to the other side of that? So just thinking about what else might call you for that. Um, with that talking about setting goals and intentions, there is, 
always proof that when you write something down, it's more likely it's going to happen. So just um, thinking about being intentional with calling um, your child in and you know, having conscious conception, whatever way that looks like for you. So I put some ideas here and this is just a start, um, but sacred objects. For me, I love feathers. So these are a metal pair. Um, I have and I also have wooden ones. I usually wear feather earrings. Um, and, you know, it could be like something where when you go for a test that are people having something that helps give them that confidence, luck or reminds them that someone is there with them. Um, maybe something that was familiar with you with an ancestor. ancestor. You'll have to see what is important and special to you. Um, I have an anecdote I'll say about that too. Um, I have this little fertility doll that I got in South Africa. Um, I believe this is Zulu. Um, I spoke at a midwife conference there in 2017. Um, so I you know, meet a lot of Uber drivers driving and they were explaining that the people are given these at their wedding. And then when once you've had the third child, it gets passed on. So that way you ensure that you you know, have enough children, but not too much. So I always thought it was interesting and um, I've held it. So I should be passing it on now that I've had my third child. Um, another one is sacred location. So for me, I love the beach. And you just think, what is bringing you solace? So when you are grieving or have whatever mood, where can you go that resets it? So, you know, is there a desert that you, the sound of the wind, um, maybe your grandmother's house where you can end up having the smells and all that brings it back to you. That may be as a memory, but these are just starts you could have to put in a journal. Or if it is like the beach, can you make it a point to go there every day? So many days, giving you that time to look forward, leave your phone behind. Um, I don't often, always take my phone to the beach, but sometimes for photos. Um, and then you're just always in awe of being there, that we're part of something connected and that it's big and powerful. Um, so you'll have to see what is that place for you. And then sacred foods as well. Um, and I, when I was finding this photo, I actually realized back this is from when I was living in Kauai in 2015. So right before I was pregnant with the twins. And again, I ate very local. Um, this is all basil, lemongrass, avocado, ulu, um, lime. And when I came back to the mainland and ended up doing um, some reproductive technology. I had the best blood work I had in four years as well. So I think just, you know, finding real whole foods, mixing what works with you. Um, I'm sure I mix with this some, you know, spicy something. I love spicy food, but just being intentional with what I'm eating as opposed to grabbing a pre-made protein bar or being on the go and just not stopping and reconnecting and having all that. And then I added this one in last night as well. So just about sound. Um, you know, is there something that, that almost like a vibration that would reset you? Um, and there are studies also that show, like with this rattle, if you were to do the sound, um, and I have it with me, you know, then your baby will recognize the sound afterwards. So this is one that I got um, when I did my full spectrum doula training in Algonquin territory. Um, and there is a Mohawk man that makes all these. So um, I do wanna give this to one of the participants at the end and I'll figure out how to do the giveaway. And also there's more than one way. So for some people, um, it, it may never happen that you achieve pregnancy um, or childbirth spontaneously. And so I wanna talk about like what other steps would be. So the classic um, when to seek help this first one they'll call it a definition of infertility. I don't like that term because I feel like it's so, it can be so negative and then make people feel a certain way like they, their body has been failing. So rather than say, you know, you fail to um, conceive, just thinking about like, okay, what is the time? Does this feel like the next progression? Um, and again, I definitely had waited longer than that with the first, but I think feeling bad, like, you know, because I'm a midwife, it should be more natural, something like that. Also, if there'd be medical history or something else that may um, be standing in the way, this could happen, you know, if we have um, a same-sex couple, um, maybe somebody before had uh, chemotherapy, and so they'd had, you know, a drugs that had got, affected their whole system. 
um, an injury to a pelvic area. And this could be man or woman, again, affecting the egg or sperm, or something in your family, you know, is passed down like a genetic defect. Um, quite, a, 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 quite a wide variety of different things right there. So just thinking about that when we're looking at history. So with doing a fertility consult, it can be a doctor or a midwife, uh, maybe a PA, it'll, it'll depend where you are and what your um, kind of like the relationship you have with the provider and what the first step would be. Um, so here's some of the things you would do maybe at the first step. Withdrawing labs, that could be some different blood tests to look and see what your hormone levels are. There's one test that is AMH that can look at a test of, it's called test of ovarian reserve anti-malarian hormone. Also just like estrogen, progesterone, you know, they change at different times through your cycle. So you wanna see if it was day three, does it look a certain pattern? Or if it's day 10, does it look different? Are you ovulating regularly? Um, test could also include uh, ultrasounds. So are you looking to see, do the ovaries, are they polycystic? Are they, um, is there a ruptured follicle? Is there torsion? Um, and then also another one, hysterosopinogram, SHG. Um, are the tubes open and patent? Um, is there any history of pelvic inflammatory disease? Do you have any fibroids? Things like that. For some people, it could be as simple as having meds to help with ovulation or balance hormones. That'd be like Clomid, um, something just makes it more regular. Sometimes for people, it's going on uh, oral contraceptive for a short while, and then that kind of can regulate a cycle too. Um, acupuncture could also come at this point. Um, just, you know, like a lower risk, easy things to do easier things to do. Interventions um, that handle sperm only. That's why I say and or midwives. Some midwives will get additional training to do IUIs. Um, that's in uterine insemination, so artificial insemination. Um, ICI is putting the sperm as close up as you can to the uterus without going inside the intracervical. intracervical. Um, and that's with sperm wash, so it's a really, they've kind of like made it super concentrated so it's easier for the, um, the good ones to get in. Um, semen analysis is also a good first stop because it's not as expensive or um, inter, uh, as much of an intervention as looking at the woman's egg quality. They'd be looking at total count, pH, um, motility, um, the movement, the, are they, do they look normal, um, and then make referral to specialists. So specialists would usually include like a reproductive endocrinologist. And again, depending where they are, it could be more of a general doctor. But this, the CDC definition for this is all fertility treatments, which eggs or embryos are handled. And um, so this is often IVF and that's in vitro fertilization. So basically the egg and sperm are meeting outside of the body. Um, not a one size fits all solution. So there's many different parts to ART and probably as we're talking, some other new process is gonna come out or something that's just starting to get approved somewhere that maybe we'll get in other areas. But generally you start at a lower risk, lower cost intervention and then move to a higher risk, higher cost intervention. Um, but it may depend on too what the person's age is. Maybe you just wanna skip some of the lower ones that might have a lower success rate and go into the higher one. Um, Unfortunately, not all parts are covered by insurance. And this is an area where really, we really have room for advocacy um, because I do believe family building is a human right. Um, and I don't think that this service would be um, you know, taken advantage of. P people that want children, you, you know, it is your right. And, and wanted children are loved and that love gets carried on. Um, and it does not have to be all or one. And this is another one that was really eye-opening and I'm really grateful for um, that you're gonna have medical. So then the whole way through has to be medical or all natural and then you can't intervene as needed. So it really can complement each other. Um, an example I have with that is like with my birth, you know, I had IVF with some of the other parts with it, um, but my children were still born at home. But some providers, that I'd met when I was interviewing where I would give birth were definitely like, oh, medical in, medical out. They're gonna have to be C-section in part because they're twins, but part there's this stigma that because you had IVF that then there's gonna be a higher um, chance of birth defects. I don't believe that to be true, but I think we'll see studies both ways. But you also have the power every step of the way. So um, you may choose to keep going 
it may get to be too much and that's fine too. And when you're done, you're done. It doesn't matter. You can change providers. You don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to go with somebody because someone else did or they saw this celebrity person or, you know, that's why I really wish this would be covered for everyone because um, it shouldn't be cost prohibitive as well. So here is a typical shot from what you might see if you're at the RE office. And this is me, um, probably November, December, 2015, um, legs and stirrups waiting to see uh, what would be the, on the ultrasound, like with um, look, just looking at your ovaries. So here's some different terminology. It starts to get really interesting. There might be some words you know or not. The first one is TTC, the trying to conceive. Um, I put this there because when, and you'll notice with, with none of the personal work I put at the beginning um, that we're not, I don't want people just going on Google and looking at that because then it starts to make it almost competitive or this person's doing this, I have to try this. But if you start to go to some of the um, websites, chat rooms, things, there's a whole lingo of trying to conceive and getting a positive test, different things, different things people do. So that one comes up. The HSG, as I mentioned earlier, is the hysteriosopenogram. And that's the, um, one of the early tests you might do if you've moved on from just ordering tests to see why someone is not achieving pregnancy, looking to see if the um, uh, tubes are, are open. And um, sometimes there's a boost in uh, pregnancy rates just after getting that. Maybe it's a thought because they've kind of got cleaned out by having the Dianet. In my case, um, they discovered a fibroid. So um, you can see the contrast eye on it. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, meds, monitoring, ovulation, induction. There is a whole bunch of different meds that will come into play with ART. So I won't really go into that. But basically, you, you have to do a series of different uh, medications to kind of get your body in a cycle to stay in like a cycle that they'll have you override during the time of um, egg retrieval and or transfer, depending if you do a fresh or a frozen. Um, and maybe the, the monitoring might go on for a couple months to look to see if you have some kind of regular cycle. Um, I was able to do natural IVF, which um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I did like a low dose to get the egg retrieval and then a natural IVF afterwards, which really meant a lot of monitoring. I had to go in for every other day blood testing. Um, when I'd asked about that, how many people were doing this, I was the only one. So really, I think often we go to a provider and we're giving up the control of just do to me what you want. But I'm a very like informed consent matters. You know, we need to have that empowering decision making along the way. And then ovulation induction. Um, once it's the middle of the cycle, either by monitoring or by the drugs you're taking, there'll be a shot given to trigger ovulation. And at that point, we know we would do either um, the ICI the, or the IUI, IUI, the artificial insemination, or IVF. Um, process kind of would start there. And so if you triggered ovulation, um, that would be where you would do an egg retrieval. Um, usually it's done under sedation. And because you've had drugs to kind of oomph up your supply, you try and get out as much as you can. Um, again, I did the Lodo, so I knew I would get less, but I wanted less of more high quality than having a bunch that maybe weren't so good. Now, the way they'll look to see how they are um, is by incubating out, okay, again, I'll back up. So you'd mix sperm and egg, that's the IVF. Um, and then um, they'll incubate them out to see how they look by cell division. So it starts to go in basic embryology um, and, I, I chose to use Embryoscope, which was an additional feature um, where every 10 minutes you're getting a picture taken to see how they're dividing and spreading out. Um, in lieu of that, people can do testing. So that's this PGS, PGD, PGTA, uh, which is pre-implantation genetic screening, genetic diagnosis, or genetic testing. So this can be useful, as I mentioned, if you had a history of genetic defects, um, or you know the trisomies, the sickle cell, but people people also do it for gender selection, and so that's where I feel like it also starts to get into like is there ethical consideration by, you know, becoming very high tech with how we do births, and we never know what's next and new for the new um, technology. Um, fresh versus frozen embryo transfer—that's another thing to consider. If someone wants to do a, a fresh transfer, they might do it if a person is older and had to put more in. Um, Often 
and again, each clinic will be different, but a frozen could be seen as easier for somebody because then you've had your body a chance to rest. You might get a natural cycle back or a birth control cycle so you can see where you'd ovulate, but you don't have all those drugs in your system that were used to boost up how many eggs you could come out. And also it's a lot cheaper for a person then too, because you don't have to do that um, egg retrieval again. You're just gonna be putting something into the uterus. Um, embryo glue can be used with that, which is um, like albumin and um, hyaluron. And so that again helps make a transfer. And the goal of doing the transfer is then to have a successful implantation. If people aren't at that stage yet, but they are thinking they um, might wanna do something in the future, now people can do egg freezing. We see that in the news a lot. Um, and actually with some success that people are able to bank their eggs to store for a long time. Other people may choose to do embryo banking. So they've gotten all the way through to egg and sperm meeting. You have the embryos and either not putting in now or just putting them out for the future. But what that means is we also now have egg, sperm, and embryos um, out there, and they can be available for adoption or donation. Um, the way crowdbanking works is you may pay a monthly fee, an annual fee, and I think for some, they may pay a little bit and they get forgotten about, or um, you know, you'd have to make sure they're protected. But embryo adoption is something new that's happening as well. And then surrogacy and adoption are other options as well. And you may move down the line. I guess I forgot one thing here as well. ICSC, that's inner cytoplasmic sperm injection. So that is taking out one single sperm um, from the sperm ejaculate that you've collected and then putting that one single sperm into one egg. So even more than just mixing egg and sperm outside and hoping they mix, you're mixing one good looking sperm with the egg that you know hopefully got graded fine and then mixing individually as well. So yeah, there's always new next things coming um, with added cost or availability. And so we'll have to just be thinking like, how does this fit in with um, complementary natural fertility? Here's a picture of my uh, children. So these are the early ones when they first went in, um, the boy on top, the girl on bottom. And for some people, this might be as far as you get. This is the blastocyst sage. So this cells are about um, hundred cells. And then getting to that um, finding out the gender, as you can see, one stayed a boy the whole time, two stayed a girl. I thought that was interesting, they never switched positions. And again, some people may just come to here or the finished product. This is not my photo, but um, I really like to, you can see like the love and attention and caring this person took. But these are all the shots given for injections um, to bring this one baby. So with or without a baby, that does not make you as a person. And that is the message I really want to put across to you because it is such a hard journey and does not need to be alone. Here's some different resources. Um, obviously your local midwife, primary care provider may have information um, and that may be your one stop or going on to reproductive clinics. I can give anybody um, suggestions for that if they want to see. Often there's um, an intro webinar like Reproduction 101 or Assisted Reproduction 101, or they'll have um, sign up for a free consult. And so if you do the class, you might get your first service there, which could be a substantial, maybe worth a couple hundred dollars, um, an ultrasound, maybe that includes your initial labs, um, just to kind of see like what is going on baseline. And then Resolve is the National Infertility um, Association. This month actually celebrates National Infertility Awareness Week that starts next week. And they do a lot of great advocacy work. They also have um, support groups. So there's some all in different time zones. PSI also has as well, which is uh, Postpartum Support International. Um, I am working with them right now to get my perinatal mental health certification. Um, and I definitely, so on, on this one, this is the only time in my slides I wrote infertility, but you can search under there, see which directors have that additional training. So you know you're getting someone that um, has sensitivity in that topic and can speak um, sweetly and kindly and, and, you know, help get the support you need when you're going through this time. And then reproductive facts is from CDC. So that will give more definitions and, um, you know, just like the straight up information. If you want to find facts about some of the drugs that you might take, or, um, again, the timelines looking at like when you should seek out different help. 
Um, I'm not sure if they update, you know, with COVID things, if anything's changed with that as well. Um, I think for a while, like elective procedures were, you know, being put off, but now that's probably diminishing different areas. And then lastly, friends, family members, trusted elders. I think just really talking to people again so that you get that experience out there. I almost left midwifery because of this. And like I said, I finished school and it was so sad and heartbreaking. I was like, I don't think I can go to birth. I can't do this. And like, you know, I feel so broken that I cannot be there for somebody. And I'm really grateful for um, my midwife friends that are here. This Marina Alzigari, this is late night after birth in Santa Barbara. And she really had pushed me to like, you know, start speaking about this topic and own it. It's fine. And, you know, break down that stigma. And I really appreciate that. Robin Lim, who I um, finished my uh, apprenticeship with, and then we've done work in various settings and taught together. This is us waiting out of her uh, typhoon in Manila. We're waiting out typhoon um, Ruby. And then Erin Ryan, who is my teacher at NMI. Um, and she was my midwife for my last child there as well. As you can see, um, this is new. I've, I've still got the placenta there. Um, she's holding my food while I'm eating. And we are just talking about, wow, that was so fast and different. So um, here's my contact. Here's my family. And I do also have an awesome husband um, who's been supportive and, you know, really gotten to see the ups and downs of this. So um, Thank you, Michael, as well, <laughs> out in the ethers. But here's my um, email and phone number. So please reach out. And I think now we'll switch back to Rhonda and go to some questions. So yes, yeah, so at this time, I'm going to open up um, and change the settings so that any, if anyone um, has any direct questions, um, I think I would. one of the reasons that I asked you to do this presentation is because there is so much just confusion on, um, you know, on that place of, of, you know, what is normal anymore. And, and I've also been hearing so much from people of just, you know, stories and maybe sensationalized, maybe not um, about just decreasing fertility um, and struggles, um, you know, with, with conception for families. Um, and so I'm just curious if you have um, any insights on that. Um, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of babies that are on their way. Um, and at the same time, a lot of people just like miscarriage are, are suffering in silence. Um, and, and so I'm just curious if you know some information on that. Yes, that is true. Um, I, a couple of features for that, but what Rhonda is saying is absolutely true. There is declining um, birth rates and not just birth rates, but fertility rates. And I think it has to do with, we're making things more automated. We are, the, you know, the air is more polluted. All of that affects it. All of the environment affects, we uh, go back to Gaji uh, the women is the first environment. So we have to keep everything as back in our bodies as we can. And we can't control all the different outside spaces. So we are seeing like the male fertility increase, uh, sorry, infertility increase. Um, you know, they're exposed to chemicals. Do they keep the phone in their pocket? All those things you have to like wonder, does that fit in? There are some studies being done on this now um, uh, in, I have to think in Africa and I'm trying to think which country because they brought this up at Women Deliver last year um, in Vancouver. Um, and secondly, people are starting to have children older, or there's more of a range of, of ages. And sometimes with the older ages, there can be issues. Doesn't mean there has to be, but there, you know, um, different things can happen um, with older parents too. Yes, what Rayanne said, plastics and toxicity. Yeah. And I think just the food we eat too, right? We have to think like, is there chemicals in the fish that we're having? Do they have fresh water to eat? Um, are things more processed? All of that ties in. And also there's a lot of contraception being given now, younger years. I, I, like, I look back to you and I think like maybe that was bad in your body because you have to almost get that out. But then you'll also get the people who go right off of um, birth control and get pregnant right away. Thank you, Gloria. And what about for miscarriage rates? Um, you know, I've, I've questioned just is it that we have such you know, technology that is just so much earlier as far as um, confirming pregnancy, um, you know, but I am working with more people that are, 
are miscarrying. And especially with just early genetic screening and things like that, you know, people have already just, you know, bonded with this baby girl in a, in a period of time where, you know, we wouldn't even confidently be able to hear the heartbeat. And um, we already have, you know, these pieces of information. And this is just with, you know, with without um, any assisted fertility. Um, and so I'm just curious if, if you could speak to that as well. Yeah, I think we, we know now that people are overall, right, pregnant, they, or they can find out that they're pregnant sooner than the abilities were before. And that could be with, yes, like looking at the early um, result pregnancy tests. So just like how soon can they get it? What measure of HCG are they measuring down to to see that comes in? Um, and the good news is I feel like recurrent miscarriages can also have something that um, could be treated, right? And that might not have been looked at before, or that might not have been included as part of people's history, but people might not also reveal that. So you have to find a way to like reach out and ask people too about the different histories. Um, but I would think it's the same as the inability to have the spontaneous conception and pregnancy, just but where we are in the world now with like the toxic pollutions and all that, what affects towards that? Because you could look again online and anything is going to say that, you know, could have the chance of causing a miscarriage. And there's all the, con the uh, back and forth earlier this year about like vaccines causing that, right? With COVID vaccines. So um, I think just honoring where the person is in that process. For some people, they may just be like, I'm moving on or really like making a ceremony about it. Um, when I had the miscarriage, it was terrible. I like, it sucked, I cried. And I feel like the, the people I was meeting did not want to, they're like, well, only if you're bleeding, come in. So I don't know what to tell you. It was like that, you know, I'd saved, I'd saved it. Um, and when I left, like made a whole ceremony with what I was going to do. Um, and I felt like that was very healing and everybody could have their own kind of grieve around it that they want to do. I'm thankful that in other places they're starting to you know acknowledge that like New Zealand had just said we're, we're going to give three days leave or something so people have a chance to like have closure and heal their body um, because no matter the stage that happens at it's really hard on us physically as well as emotionally too especially if yes people have already started to be told um, or, or told other children something like that um, and I think just breaking down the stigma there is some um, um, social media campaigns about that too, like hashtag I had a miscarriage, um, where you can start to share your story and see and really feel like you're not alone. And sometimes the online connections might be all that people have, especially with stuck at home right now, or if you had other kids and are worried about going out or it's winter, you have one car. And so you're looking for that connection um, to feel like, okay, it's okay, or I'm going to get through this. Um, I'd love to see an Maybe someday I'll offer this to like, you know, the retreat about it where you get to like move through the process and what does it mean to go through that experience? Um, and then how is that gonna affect your life in the future? Because it does, it changes you, it's, it's part of it. At what point for someone who was experiencing a miscarriage, I just, I also receive this question a lot of, um, you know, there is the, the emotional healing piece and of course, you know, returning to a normal cycle rhythm, for example, but all those things that you were suggesting, I want to just, you know, uh, uh, for people working on just optimizing their fertility, and it's, they're not in a place of needing assistance. Um, you know, what, what kind of a time frame if, if there was ideal planning, um, you know, do you feel like you would give for people, whether it's after miscarriage or just in the, the preparing for pregnancy, um, you know, would you give some, speak to, to that? And mostly because it's once again, questions that I receive a lot of, you know, how do you prepare for pregnancy and, um, you know, and, and what time frames are just kind of a plan for that? I think preparing for pregnancy, um, if you could give at least six months, that would be great. And again, it's gonna depend on the age and factors. Um, but then you have a chance to look and see like, you know, am I ready for a child? And not just financially, but like, what does that mean to like call somebody in and look at the long-term planning of that? 
you know, do I, um, Am I eating the foods I want to have that are going to nu nurture my child? Am I connected with the eggs I already have in my body, um, you know, that, are, that will become my children and the grandchildren? Um, and if, you know, ac for some people, acupuncture has worked really well. Uh, I've used it for a couple different things. I really enjoyed that. So that was something that spoke to me. And when you talk with it, the, and there's actually really good research about um, acupuncture with helping fertility. Um, but it does, it's not a quick fix. You kind of have to go and then your body's making these different shifts. Um, so that's why I think too, just like making the plan, getting grounded. If you know you've got something big coming up, you're doing around the world or all these travels and you have to eat bad, maybe that's not the time or you don't have to worry about it and focus on it. That being said, if there was you know, you have a goal to go sooner or six months doesn't work for whatever reason. Maybe you had to start some kind of new treatment. Um, you know, you start where you're at and you, you make it as best that you can. Um, as far as miscarriage, I believe after you'd, even after one, um, you should be able to get some, like look to see like why may that have happened. That's not always gonna be the case, but especially with two, um, you know, you, you could, you, you could see like, do I want to test any of that? Do I want to look to see something's gone? Or do I just need a little progesterone, mm -hmm. um, which has been shown to like really increase pregnancy rates. Um, sorry, like holding a pregnancy. It could also be like just upping different food. And the, again, I think it depends where you are, but the standards seem to change from taking time in between trying again to going right back to trying again because you have a small bump um, of, of a pregnancy rate right after you've had a miscarriage in that next cycle. Um, and I, that is something like, for example, I chose to consciously do that um, because I was like, well, if I'm gonna have a child, this will be the time. So every case is different, but I think just taking the time to like see how you feel and you might you know, feel one way and then it kind of comes and goes right grief is not linear so we go back and forth like this too um and then you'll see something that reminds you of it like last night too i was like you know i'm gonna end up putting in this picture that which is the one picture i have from that uh pregnancy but then i was like oh it's sweet how it like ties into the sun and that's my family now and you know would it'll be like up to choose how, how you like say stuff with your children or pass on but it can become part of your story but it's the story doesn't have to stop right there um, look and see what Brian wrote. Yes, motherhood is so highly revered and it, uh, not, it is not the, the end result for everybody. So, and, and at the same time, just because you have a child doesn't mean that you are cured from those feelings of having, um, that's why I say like, I'm a survivor. I don't feel like that is just gone then because you have a child. It doesn't wash away the other feeling. You have a miscarriage, the next baby doesn't wash it away. Um, the next pregnancy doesn't wash it away. And so that's why it's really important what, you're, you're, what you say, that your words matter and finding the support like that too. Because people may say that something that they think is helpful, right? Just relax, you can try again. Um, at least it wasn't this, blah, blah, blah. And that, that may make it actually worse because you're like, fine for you to say, but you're not in my shoes, right? So we can't judge how people are feeling, but just like really being aware of the feelings. And maybe you don't have the words, but then just holding space. And, you know, I'll be there. If you want to talk about it, it's fine. But then we're not putting a judgment on somebody or um, answering for them. So Rayanne um, uh, has, uh, I asked if, if she could share her words, Rayanne Madison, um, who teaches beautiful, beautiful classes. And I wanted to just read her words because she's busy with her toddler. <laughs> Um, and it says, I find there's a huge cultural pressure too, because mother's, motherhood is so highly revered in indigenous cultures, almost to the point of pedestalization, talking about infertility as a space of preconception and venerating the kinship roles can help. Um, and so when I see that, it's, it's that yes, there, there is a place for, for all of us. Um, you know, I, I do have a child and one child and I'm expecting um, a grandchild this summer, um, but I ached for more children 
and it's it's not part of my story. And I've certainly worked with people um, who, you know, that that will not be part of of how they're they're walking in their family, and um, you know, really supporting each person that you know we are we are you know, that quote you read of just value and, um, and that there is this, you know, unique role for the aunties, you know, for, for people that, you know, may not uh, birth a child from their body, or even raise a child in their home, whatever that may look like, um, that, you know, it's not what defines who we are. Um, and at the same time, um, I, I can understand that ache and um, and that if there are any ways we can be be supporting people um, to be able you know to have healthier pregnancies and you know to be able to have that baby that that they're dreaming about um, you know we can all contribute to just supporting um, you know the the supporting each other with those those foods those medicines all those things that you listed in that that those beginning slides of, of stress and good food and, you know, honoring space and, and all of those, those pieces are, um, are ways that we need to love on each other. So thank you for including that in your slide in your presentation. That is one like that comes up too. And I, I don't, I didn't mention it so much because not my story, but this happens um, frequently, is the secondary infertility like that. So, you know, people have the first child and it's no issue. So great. They want to have the other, the, the next, they're ready for the next. And then that next never comes or they didn't realize it'd be a struggle. And then that again goes into something. And then you get that chatter of, at least you have one or this, right? Um, and then they might not know like where they can go to get support as well. Um, but yeah, I think we just, it's nourishing the next generation from um, conception forward, preconception forward, so that then our children know too about like making healthy choices, you know, talking about pregnancy and birth. I'm sure all birth workers here do this already, right? With, with your young children, you know, giving the real words to what items are and um, teaching about body autonomy and, you know, making choices and just like, so that they know then like how they're nourishing their food uh, sorry, nourishing themselves it doesn't have to be, you know, giving into peer pressure or doing different things, um, like with making food choices or, you know, wanting to have all this electronics and things. And like maybe there's other reasons, right, that we that we're going into um, being outside and all that. And I will say too, one more thing, um, you know, these these emotions. It's also been proven now, which we've already thought about for a long time, speculated that your, your DNA holds us, holds the trauma, holds the emotions. So that is important because what you're feeling now is what's going to be passed on to your grandchildren because you're born with your eggs like that. Um, before I knew I was having a boy, uh, my first twins are boy and girl, um, I felt like I'm never going to connect with having a boy child. I, I never really something I thought about. I'm an auntie too. I think 11 nieces, he's the only boy in the family. But then once I knew I was a boy um, and I was doing the training with the Mohawk midwives um, in Algonquin, they were saying, well, you know, with a boy, you have to really connect with when they're gonna start hitting puberty and that's your future like that. And then I was like, oh, okay, good. I've got years to fall in love and it's fine. Obviously I'd connected and we are loved, but that just made it be like so sweet because it's like sh showing you as a parent um, or elder, auntie community person right wherever our relationship is that we have this responsibility like with how we feel and how we're, we're presenting ourselves out there because then that is affecting the next generations um and so i think that's really important too and that you know will tie in with gentle parenting and different topics all along the way so it's not just about preconception and pregnancy but just really being intentional okay do we have any other questions or people who would like to just share stories it's completely oh, open for Olga them. has her hand raised are you there hi yes i have a question um would you would you be able to talk about or maybe i'm um, kind of share um if it has been your experience um 
how to support, I'm thinking me as a future birth worker, how do we support people who wanna um, get pregnant or got pregnant spont spontaneously, uh, but in the past didn't treat their bodies with care? Um, this could be such as like drug or alcohol use or other things. Um, and I've, I've heard the worry behind them when it was spontaneous and you know, then now they're worried about baby and how they'll grow and develop. And then also the worry of how long do I have to wait for it to clear to my system to then be able to start. Um, so would you please talk more about that if you can? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think the one beauty of pregnancy, uh, there's many beauties, but um, is that people aren't really open to change at that point because now for the time in their life, something is beyond their control too. What they're doing is not just affecting themselves, but the future unborn child. So I think going into that could be good for knowing, like if you mentioned drugs, like that they're going to make a change, not have a relapse. It's giving something to live for than like that. So you know, we see that used effectively with marketing, but we also see people make positive changes during that time. So just supporting them and meeting them where they are. Um, I don't believe that it is like a criminal charge or anything to be, to be using um, during pregnancy. So it's just, you know, trying to get like the harm reduction um, or if they stopped just being like, you know, that was yesterday, you can't control it. You're not gonna go back and change it. You don't want them to do something that then would harm them or like, you know, read on, let's say read online that some, they take this that interacts with what they just did, right? So you almost have to be like that, at least that's what I would do, right? Like meet them where they're at and then just say, we're going to do this going forward. And then you're the person they can check in with, right? So if you're their trusted birth worker, um, companion, you know, however it is, like you're, you're going to check in with them and you can tell them, like you can reach out. And if you're feeling this, I will be there. Maybe they just need to hear something and hear somebody or they'll confide in you because you know they don't wanna share with someone else, um, including maybe a health worker. Maybe they didn't put something on their history and then they're thinking if, I, if they do or not. So yeah, just holding the space, um, you know, telling them like be, to stay in the present because worrying does not help you do anything, right? I, I know I've spent, way too much of my life worrying about things where then later I'm like, that was out of my control. So, you know, just trying to like shift that mindset because the baby can feel that too, right? So the cortisol goes through and we want that just to be nice and peaceful. Um, like it could be simple as drawing something. If they can't stop and think, then just, you know, doodle, write something, get it out of their body. So it moves through, it's not just staying in their body. I would add to just add a few things to that. Um, I think that, um, you know, there, there have been many times where, you know, I've just been like, oh, you know, I, I wish I wouldn't have eaten that yesterday or wow, I'm amazed I survived that crazy year and all of the, the things. Um, and that there's, that we all hold those different things. And that I want to just really say that, um, you know, for people who, are, are conscious about those choices that they made in the past and that they have made a choice that they, they don't want that to continue to be a part of their story and they want a healthy pregnancy. There are so many places we can go to help heal and, you know, and help people to be stronger in that. Um, so I, I frequently will go you know, back to, to plants and adding in positive things, you know, like I don't want people to feel guilty for eating that McDonald's, but I want to encourage them to drink that tea or eat that mousse or, you know, that, that there is these shifts that people can make. And so some people, if they're not currently pregnant and they just really want to be healthy, that might be sitting, may, just making that space and time to set individual goals with them. Maybe they want to do a cleanse, you know, maybe they want, you know, like I um, have known people who went on a traditional foods fast for a week, um, you know, and, or even would do that for three days every single month while they were preparing for their pregnancy um, or people that would just, it could be as simple as that they start prenatal vitamins or start drinking metal tea, um, you know, that it can be something like that. Um, but it's, it's, we have a lot that we can do to help heal people's hearts um, 
and that that's important part of this work too. It's it's so beyond, you know, the uh, the vitamins. Um, it's it's about um, you know that you know you are you're really walking this road to be healthy and strong, and you know to heal your body and prepare to greet this baby, and you know that we want to support them in that. Um, and so you know I, I think in you know, Margaret's on this call and, um, you know, with the Alaska Native Birth Workers um, community and at a plant medicine class we did recently, um, you know, I was just reading the this, this story of how nettle saved the people by Roger Fernandez of um, the Lower Elwha tribe and just the, there's this one line <laughs> um, in that story and, you know, it's his stories on YouTube and, you know, and I want to honor him um, for him just really encouraging people to say it, but, you know, it's, it tells the story of just taking in this, taking in the nettle and the line is, I will be strong for my people. I will be strong for my ancestors. I will be strong for the generations to come. And I just keep having that come up. Um, you know, within me when I just think of that line and I think of these plants and I think of how if we just from that first, you know, bit of someone accepting and choosing to move forward with this journey that we greet them there of, you know, here, let me, let me support you. And, you know, there's so many ways that, that you can take in that strength. Um, and, you know, and that we're, it's, it's not a promise. It's not a guarantee. It's not saying everything's going to be fine. Of course, you know, you're going to conceive of, of course, you know, like I, I worked with one midwifery preceptor who really struggled and, and was, was never able. I mean, there was one time at a visit where she had me palpate her ovary. Um, and it was just the amount of, of, injections and struggle and, you know, in, in, in chose adoption. Um, but, the, the reality of that struggle of being a person who everyone would look at and see like, you look so vibrant and healthy and, you know, you're a midwife and you just, you know, exude fertility and, um, and at the same time had this really silent struggle. Um, so I'm talking in a lot of different directions, but um, I guess that what I want to just say is that add in those positives help people heal their heart and forgive themselves for whatever has their their body their life has chosen and that we can add we can add and we can help people in whatever their own unique journey is and that every single aspect is going to feel so different for every single person you know someone who's struggled to to conceive may have a very different story than someone who's had repeat miscarriages as as someone you know who's had four children and is is confused on why you know the the, the next baby just isn't staying you know there's there's every single person has a unique story and so as far as your advice on how to or what you were asking of advice on how to sit with people it's it's one that you know applauding all of the positive, positive things by simply making a choice and being aware and working to heal their body is, is going to be that first crucial, you know, crucial and, and important one. I will add, I, I specifically had, late, had um, left off like herbs and, you know, names of foods because I know we are from all different places. And so I want it to be like, what calls to you, what is available and what, when you're in your communities, you're able to um, get Okay, does anyone else who has shared in the chat box want to share anything that they've written? Okay, so Jacqueline, I think we can, if you wanna just move into a, a closing and um, and then we can you know, end this recording for today. Okay. Um, well, in closing, let's just have a moment of gratitude. Um, it's such an honor to get to share this information, um, but also then hear back the passions knowing these are important topics and they've been forever. Um, that, you know, technology will come, go, different trends, bads, the, you know, 
outside interventions, but that we are the people that are here for um, our communities. And if we can be, you know, strong in ourselves, lean on people when needed, we can be there for others as well. So thank you for joining today. Um, I hope that everybody learned something and please reach out if you have additional questions.